Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Rob, for the nice introductory words uh, and also for giving us, AGP, the opportunity to talk about some relevant topics regarding transparent armor. Um, my name is Christoph Schulz. I'm uh, the sales director of uh, AGP Glass in Europe, um, representing all security glass aspects for European clients. Um, and I'm happy to be here to share with you some, well, some insights into what are the challenges, uh, what are the production processes, um, yeah, and some outlooks regarding transparent armor systems. So I have uh, a rough schedule, what I will talk about. So first of all, I would like to give you some insights into the functionality and what transparent armor systems really are. Then I will talk about some challenges in production and also usage of transparent armor systems. And then I would like to give you as end users, but also some, maybe some uh, armored vehicles manufacturers, even though they are knowing quite well about uh, uh, transparent armor systems, but some important uh, facts about um, uh, these complex uh, composites in usage before in the end I will quickly go through some slides of AGP group so who does not know our company to get some some insights as well. I think it was quite a, go a good start yesterday as some of you have been at the live shooting event uh, to see really in in detail live uh, what uh, does it mean to shoot on a on a transparent armor system so we had a vehicle there which has been shot and we had two uh, coupons there where we were putting some, some uh, bullets on. And there you already saw the limitations, of course, of, uh, of such um, materials. But I will go through that uh, a little bit more in detail now. So bullet resistant glass, what is it? And what is the functionality? So in principle, uh, it's not just a simple and stupid glass block. It's a very complex construction, a uh, very complex composite of uh, different materials. And um, it's a combination of glass and a lot of plastics, a lot of foils in between the glass layers. So just to give you an impression about the complexity of such a, let's say a 70 millimeter uh, armored glass, which would stop uh, an armored piercing bullet like we saw yesterday. Uh, this has, um, this has around 11 materials to be com combined uh, and um, uh, about 22 surfaces that need to stick together. And that's the problem. Uh, that's the principal problem of, of such materials that uh, you need to um, combine glass and plastics in, a, in, a, in an autoclave process. And those materials, they are not meant to be stick together so they always want to tear apart and this is the big challenge of uh, uh, an, an armored glass manufacturer to extend this process of so-called delamination this is what we, we call uh, when the materials uh, tear apart so this is the main challenge to extend this uh, this um, this phenomenon of uh, delamination to as long as possible so you have um, uh, a lot of um, suppliers of armored glass nowadays, but you have a lot of a, a big difference between high quality manufacturers and, and low cost, low quality manufacturers. So this is a, a main point uh, by using special materials, by using uh, special um, production processes in order to keep this complex composites together. In addition to that, we are not only bonding these materials together, but we are also bringing additional functionalities in this uh, in these compositions, like uh, we are including heating mats uh, for the windscreens, for example. We are including gun ports. Uh, we are uh, including sun bands, black bands, whatever uh, you name it. And this is also increasing the complexity even of those uh, materials um, to stick together for a longer time. Um, well, the functionality, um, as we saw yesterday, the functionality of uh, a bullet-resistant glass is the following. So you have on the left side, you have a bullet entering the composition, and it, it hits the strike face, so the first glass layer. Uh, then it enters into the composition um, by um, 
destroying um, the different layers. So we have, in this case, we have the strike phase, and then we have um, different intermediate layers, um, like different glass layers, the so-called uh, B intermediate layers. And then we have the adhesives that um, bond these materials together before in the end, in the inner side of the armored uh, composition, we have the polycarbonate, which uh, you all might know, which is a very sensitive and vulnerable uh, layer, but it has a very um, important function by, um, uh, by um, catching the, the rest fragments. So the bullet enters from the left side into the composition, goes through it before it's finally stopped, and this is called uh, energy, energy absorption. And I hope the next video will work. So I will show you an, with a high um, uh, speed camera the impact dynamics uh, when such a bullet is entering um, the composition. So on the left side, it will hit the strike phase. So um, bullet is entering, so you have a lot of splinters coming on the outside. Uh, then the, the bullet is entering into the composition by destroying the, the single layers. So you also see here the shock wave of the bullet, the energy absorption, uh, before in the end it will be stopped by the composition itself and the polycarbonate as the, as the spore liner will, um, will then do its job. And uh, you see um, a dynamic bulge um, of, the, of the bullet, but in the end, um, if the bullet has been stopped, you always also see a, a static bulge which you see in the in the inside of the of the material and this um, you could very well see yesterday during the live shooting event as well so what challenges do we face uh, when we produce such a complex composition um, first of all we have some internal factors so if we are not using the right processes uh, the right uh, uh, vacuum processes within, within the autoclave system, we, if we are not using the, the correct and high quality uh, raw materials, um, if we are not edge sealing, um, sealing the, the edges in a proper way, uh, this will all lead to uh, some defects in the glass composition. So on the right side you see this typical delamination which already can occur um, within the production process. Um, but you can also see little bubbles when the the production process is not is not uh, fully controlled or not in a proper way. Um, <clears throat> then on we have some external factors. This is more uh, the defect uh, pictures of uh, what can happen when you are using these armored glasses. So on the right side, the most common one is is uh, again the delamination, which can already occur while um, constructing an armored glass into a vehicle. So uh, you have to respect some, some, uh, some construction uh, facts. For example, to, to have uh, a minimum um, gap between the armored glass and the frame itself, because the, when the armored glass is heated up, the polycarbonate uh, is expanding. So if there's not enough space between the armored glass and the frame, the polycarbonate by expanding will touch the frame and then if it's getting um, uh, colder again, it goes back and then you, you have a, a risk of a delamination in this area. But also um, you have a lot of environmental influences um, on, the, on the glass by when you are using these, these glasses in your vehicles. For instance, if you are um, operating the vehicle in a, in a um, high temperature area environment, you are heating up the glass. So, um, but on the other side, you might uh, use the vehicles in a, in a cold environment, so the glasses will be uh, cooled down uh, to, to minus temperatures. And, and this will also have an influence on the performance, but also on, the, on a possible delamination of, of the materials when, you, when these materials are exposed to UV radiation, to solar, uh, to humidity. Um, so this all needs to be considered um, while using these materials. Also, as I said before, the polycarbonate on the inside is a very vulnerable and sensitive material. So if you're using the wrong cleaner uh, in the vehicle, you are destroying the, 
the, the complete uh, glass. And I think everybody of the users here uh, have experienced this uh, this error. And uh, so the, the, the glass gets so-called blind and you have to replace it. So uh, this is also a very important fact, um, the handling and treatment of, uh, of the glasses while in usage. And also you, you might have cracks um, on the polycarbonate inside when you, again, when you are using wrong cleaners. Um, uh, so, and then also you, you need to replace the glasses. So, <coughs> sorry. One thing which also is uh, very important is the, the clear transmittance um, of reality. This is vital in uh, when you are driving the vehicle. So any error in the windscreen um, you might have, um, whether it is a distortion or a double image, uh, will um, not only uh, disturb the driver. Um, having a big distortion in the windscreen, uh, the driver will be uh, sick in a, in a very short time. So this is also uh, an absolute quality criteria um, to, to look at. Um, here I'm sh showing you a picture of uh, left of an optical distortion. So if you have an optical distortion, it's almost impossible to, to really handle this vehicle and you want to have your people sitting in the vehicle, uh, sitting behind, uh, of course, a safe glass but also a glass where you can look through without getting sick in a short time. Also, the phenomenon of a double image is, is uh, you want to exclude uh, when you drive at night and a vehicle is, is uh, approaching you, you want to see the two lights of the vehicle and not the four lights because there is too much distortion. Um, so what is important from an end use perspective? Um, I would like to give you some, some thoughts about that. Maybe uh, as an end user, when, once you, um, you are writing uh, your specification of a, an armored vehicle, uh, that you might also think of uh, in the future of, okay, I have uh, armored glass inside this vehicle and this armored glass is an, an absolute integral part of, of the vehicle, an important part of the vehicle. Because as we saw in, in many, many pictures, once a vehicle is being attacked, it's been always attacked uh, in, the, in the windows. This is the first, uh, the first target the, the enemy is going to shoot at um, because behind that he's, he's seeing the people. So um, there are some aspects uh, I would like to make you sensitive about. Maybe uh, next time uh, you, you will also think uh, about uh, looking and defining some, some uh, aspects here. So first of all, um, there's always there's big dis discussions always is glass bulletproof or is glass bullet resistant or is a vehicle bulletproof or bullet resistant? So of course glass is not bulletproof. It's bullet resistance according to the specification and the definition of the threat level. So there's a lot of rumors and if you look into LinkedIn, uh, there are some, well, uh, not so serious people uh, offering vehicles and say, oh, my, my vehicle is B6 approved. So it's, it's first of all, B6 is a, is a, is, is defi defining the bullet itself, but it's not a certification of a complete vehicle. So the certification will be according to VPAM standard, for instance. But um, um, so, um, yeah, as I said, uh, there is no uh, bulletproof material. And we saw the limitations yesterday during the live shooting event. When you shoot uh, uh, several times at the same spot, the glass will not stop the bullet. So it's, it's not that the glass is bad. It's just because the glass is not being designed for stopping multiple bullets at one single point. And, uh, and this scenario, to be honest, is not very realistic because once you get the first shot, you're, you should really try to get out of the, the theater and, and escape. So uh, it's very unlikely that you really get uh, several shots in the, same, in the same spot. But also we showed yesterday um, that... Um, the limitation of, uh, of these two coupons we have uh, been shooting in the end, uh, which was designed uh, with a 40 millimeter glass, which was designed for stopping uh, the 762 by 51 NATO ball uh, ammunition on a triangle of 120 millimeters. We, um, we wanted to show you, okay, what is the limitation when shooting with an armored piercing bullet on this composition? And of course, 
This was not, uh, not a surprise. Uh, the first bullet uh, penetrated the glass because it was not, it was not designed for stopping this, this bullet uh, with a 40 millimeter glass composition. For, for, so for stopping this um, armored piercing bullet, we, we would have needed to increase the thickness to 70 millimeters, so from 40 to 70. And then we would have stopped three shots in a triangle of uh, 120 millimeters. So, um, yeah, this is what I'm, I'm telling you here. And um, this is well, so. <laughs> so I'm going to the next one. So, as I said, <coughs> um, protection is, is always relative to the definition of the armored material or the armored glass. So we can define, or you should, de you should define uh, very well to what standard you want to have the glasses or at least the, 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 the vehicles to be protected. So there are different standards from the US standard NIJ uh, up to the OCN uh, European norm. Um, you have the standard norms which are more uh, represented in the, in the military industry. Mm, so I'm focusing now on the, on the VPAM standard and we later on have, uh, I think, much more insight into the VPAM standard <laughs> through TNO. So I'm not telling you a lot about this, but um, um, yeah. So yeah, we are designing uh, the the armored glass, the transparent armor, according your definition of what you want to have. So if you are d want to have a, a VPAM seven standard, uh, that this me this means that uh, we are designing this composition according to the standards which which uh, um, perfectly describe the the test conditions. So here, this is more for the definition of the of armored vehicles, um, where you can uh, describe the according to the VPAM, uh, the BRV edition three or the new VPAM uh, ERV edition three or edition two, and um, we will hear more about that um, at a later stage. Okay, <coughs> so this is uh, one topic which is uh, really influencing having impact on on transparent armor which is which are the uh, in my environmental conditions the vehicle is operating so a lot of uh, end users especially also armed forces they are asking for uh, so-called environmental tests uh, of the glass because um, running the vehicle you are not running the vehicle at uh, at the test um, conditions which the VPAM says which is uh, room temperature but you are running the vehicles in high and uh, low temperature areas. So this has a great impact on the durability of the material uh, as, it's, as it will be, it, it will, well, it's so-called aging of material. So uh, the material will age when it's being exposed to high and low temperatures. Um, and also the, the ballistics uh, will have a, 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 a well, the, the temperatures have a, have a great uh, impact on the ballistics of the, of the glass uh, solution itself. So we can do uh, these environmental qualification testings on external facilities, but also we have in-house capabilities of doing so-called accelerated aging tests of the material itself. So this is one point I, I would really like to, to emphasize on, uh, because if you're writing your requirements for an armored vehicle, you're not... <coughs> I guess you are not asking for uh, the material qualification, the material certification of the armored glass at high and low temperatures. So this is something I would really um, urge you to think about um, that you uh, ask for as a prerequisite for your vehicle to have the glass certified at high and low temperatures because uh, it makes a really big difference if you are heating up the materials Standard is plus 49 minus 33 degrees. So you are in this test scenario, you're heating up the, the glass to plus 49 degrees in an oven, take out the glass and directly shoot and certify it. And you take the next coupon and uh, cool it down to minus 32 degrees and then take it out and shoot it. So the, the usage of materials in this material composition uh, is a complete different rather than certifying and testing the glass at room temperature. But what happens if you're, you're driving with your cars in these in this high and uh, low temperature areas, the glass will heat up, maybe not to, to plus 49, 
degrees in the complete composition until the core of the material, but definitely the material will, uh, will be hot and will be cold from time to time. And you want to make sure that if your people are driving in this, in this vehicle, that they are secured and they are safe behind uh, the glass when the glass is heated up or it's cooled down. So that's, that's why I'm really urging you to think about this, this topic. And um, we have uh, several um, ballistic solutions that have been certified at uh, different test labs, German test labs, uh, Dutch test labs, of course. <laughs> um, and um, so we can show you um, uh, these, these certificates as well. And of course, uh, weight is always an issue. As you saw, these uh, glasses are thick, they are heavy. Um, so our clients are asking for con continuous weight reduction in order to increase the payload of the vehicles. Um, so there are certain limitations, of course, of, uh, of uh, glass weights. Um, so um, giving you an example of a Stanak 3 solution, which is an armored piercing um, um, uh, bullet with a tungsten carbide, um, where we came from uh, around 87 millimeters and 208 kilograms per square meter, so really heavy block. Uh, at the moment, uh, in the development, we are at around 180 kilos, so it's a weight saving of uh, almost 30 kilos per square meter. And um, if you take like uh, five square meters in a, in a Toyota Land Cruiser, this is quite quite a number to to save your weight. And the development uh, within midterm, we are targeting to reach uh, 100 and what is it? I don't have my glasses on. 144 kilos per square meter, which, which is really uh, uh, an impact in the, in the performance also. Um, <clears throat> so this is something we more and more see from our clients that they are asking for higher light transmission values of the glass. So the thicker you get uh, the, your composition, the lower the light transmission values uh, will be when you use normal standard soda lime glass in your composition. So um, this will help having a, let's we call it white glass, uh, where we use different uh, materials, so um, low iron glasses, then you, you can increase your light transmittance values. <coughs> Oops, that was the wrong one. Oh no, here. You can increase the light transmittance values to above 75% uh, in a 100 millimeter glass thickness. So this will help you to, to operate the night vision goggles um, behind these glasses. <coughs> so I also would like to emphasize on, on the traceability of, of uh, each glass. So every uh, glass uh, which leaves our facility has a unique um, printed number in, in the glass, even though you have a very small glass or a very large glass, no matter of that. Mm. We have um, printed a unique traceability number where you can be sure of and where you can trace back all the processes of this single glass and all the raw materials of the single glass. This is very important. <coughs> when you um, have a vehicle program and uh, that you are sure that vehicle 50 has the same uh, glass composition, has the same materials, the same production processes than vehicle one, or even uh, the, the, the certified vehicle. So you have to make sure, and we can trace back this with this number and give you that proof, that um, the vehicle that has been certified with this glass um, is the same glass and the same composition and the same materials and the same performance that the glass which is included in, in your armored vehicles that you, you're gonna send in the field. <coughs> uh, as I said, durability is, is, a, is a very big <coughs> issue. Um, we are focusing on developing and using um, processes where we have extended dur durability. So um, as we see uh, in, in, in several cases in the market, low quality glasses start to delaminate, might start to delaminate after, after six months or one year. <coughs> and we have uh, glasses in, in the field uh, where there's no delamination after 
eight, nine, ten years, which we always not can uh, guarantee because, you, as I said before, the environmental <coughs> conditions are very much uh, um, influencing the durability of glasses, but um, our glasses are very long lasting and we have different uh, technologies that we have developed like uh, a special edge sealing where we prevent uh, uh, humidity and solvents going into the into the, the block of the glass. So your this is um, our so-called edge plus technology. We have developed uh, certain solutions in order to protect the the sensitive uh, polycarbonate, um, one is called DuraP, where we apply in the process uh, a polymer on the inside of the polycarbonate, and so that you can or your users uh, don't need to think about what cleaner uh, they are using. They can even clean the the, in the, the glasses from inside with a um, with gasoline. So we have made some some. Uh, exercises with that. We have uh, a, a solution called Dura-G where we apply a very thin glass on the inside of, uh, of the polycarbonate in order to protect this. And we have Dura-NPC uh, where we replace the uh, polycarbonate by uh, another plastic which is not so vulnerable. This all to increase durability and make it easier for you to use these glasses. So just some quick facts um, about AGP Group. Um, we are in this business since 1965, um, developing and producing transparent armor systems, complex transparent armor systems. Um, we are still a family-owned company uh, with German origins. Uh, started our businesses in, in Peru, and that's the name invention of AGP. It's called Autoglass Peruana. So these were the origins of our company. Then we expanded the operations uh, to different countries. Uh, we have segmented our product lines into AGP S-Glass and AGP E-Glass. S-Glass is um, transparent armor systems for um, civilian armored vehicles and transparent armor systems for, um, for naval ships and also for um, military vehicles. And we have uh, one segment which is called e-glass. This is um, uh, standard laminated glasses uh, in light weight for um, electric and autonomous vehicles. So today we are at six plants. We just have uh, opened another plant in Mexico, uh, our seventh plant, uh, with more than 2,500 2, people. Um, this is an overview of our locations. Our uh, security class classes are produced in South America, mainly in uh, Colombia and in Brazil, from where which we are supplying the whole world. Um, and we have uh, our e-glass factories we have in Belgium, in just op newly opened in Mexico, and there will be a future one in China. And um, we have so-called commercial units where we are uh, serving our clients uh, locally. Our European uh, commercial unit is based in Germany, so where I'm based as well. So from there we give uh, technical and commercial support um, to our clients. So there's a quick overview of our main customers. We have more than 1,000 customers uh, worldwide. Uh, in the um, in the military land sector on the left side, in civilian armored platforms. Um, you also see some of them here in the exhibition and in the automotive industry. So, well, coming to an end, um, if you have questions, you're very welcome to ask now or later on, I will be the whole day here. Also, I think tonight we have some good opportunity to get into more discussions or you can always send me an email and ask for specific information. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the good presentation. My name is Imad Bakti. I work for Yon ACR as the blast and structural engineer based here in Geneva. Actually, I'm trying to understand, is related to the part of the presentation about the end user information, like uh, that is uh, good for end user as us. Uh, is there like the slide about the temperature, like from minus? Uh, yeah. 
and for plus 49. So I always was thinking and trying to understand the impact of like the difference in temper temperature. So let's say, for example, in Iraq, the external temperature is 45 while inside, while driving for two hours, they have the AC on 16. So the difference is like 20 plus hmm. degrees. Same in Ukraine where the outside temperature might be zero and inside they have the heater on 30 degrees and let's say again, 20 plus uh, degrees of difference. What would be the impact in that situation? So we are not talking about 49 plus 49 on both sides, mm -hmm. or minus 36 <coughs> or minus zero, minus 10 on both sides. So what did this like? Did you ever consider this difference in temperature during the testing or shooting on on a, uh, mm -hmm. a glass? And well, not only this, sorry, like even in the incident, like uh, time of an incident was shooting. So it's not only the the, the lamination or of the glass also during the shooting if there is a difference between outside and the inside the temperature. Thanks. Well, the, um, the, <coughs> the scenario how you, how the, the standard, the VPAM standard or the other standards, how they are asking uh, to be tested will be always on, on room temperature. So you're conditioning the glasses at 20 degrees and then you are, you are shooting the glass. Um, so the impact of, of having outside a uh, temperature of plus 45 and inside of, of, of 20, this uh, has not been really tested because this scenario is, is difficult to set up. But um, what, we, what we did and um, what some, some end users are already asking for is to, to condition the glass to a very high temperature and shoot it really at this high temperature and then the, the, the glass will be conditioned also in the core of the glass will be conditioned in that temperature. So we have temperature sensors also uh, where we can measure the, the temperature of the core itself and also to cool down the, the glasses to this uh, low temperature. And these are the, both the worst case scenarios we are, we are applying. So if, we, if the glass composition is stopping the bullet at plus 49 degrees and we are conditioning these glasses, it's also a question of definition, 12 hours or 24 hours. Uh, so this scenario, if this uh, scenario is, is met and also stopping the bullet at minus 32 degrees, then you have the, the two extremes which, which, you have, which you have tested. So you can be sure of that this scenario you are talking about, that this, this is no, uh, no issue at all. But it might be an issue if, if you're only testing the glass at, at, uh, at room temperature but the vehicle is, is standing outside for a, a long time and the glasses are heating up. So this might be a, have an impact on the ballistic performance, which might be not have been uh, tested and certified in the vehicle. That's why I'm, I'm trying to make you more sensitive of this temperature topic of the glass testing itself. Yeah. Because the vehicle, as I said, the vehicle is being tested and certified at, at room temperature and not at uh, high and low temperature, because you cannot heat up a vehicle to completely to plus uh, 49 degrees. So, so you make a pre-test with a glass and then you test the vehicles at room temperature. At temperature. John? Yeah, uh, Roger Schaefer, IOBG. Maybe I can uh, add to your yeah, uh, comments, <laughs> uh, Christoph. So of course it's not part of certification to do testing uh, where you have uh, outside temperature and, and or like you said, you have the AC in, in inside the vehicle heating up or, or cooling down. Uh, so that's not part of the certification, but we did uh, some kind of testing for a study purpose. And um, so I don't have a general answer, but you can say that looking on transparent armor, like Christoph also mentioned in his um, presentation, the PC layer, of course, is a sensitive part of, of the complete composition. And if you, for instance, uh, heat or, um, or, or uh, um, go with minus temperature from the inside, you will also always uh, have a similar effect like, for instance, uh, if you heat or cool uh, the complete composition before when you test. Let's say if you uh, uh, go with minus temperatures just from the uh, inside, so cooling down the PC layer, and uh, heating the, the glass from the outside, you will get the tendency to get a, a similar result like you cool down the complete uh, um, um, glass. And uh, it's true also for the opposite. 
Good morning. Thank you very much, Alex Rebel from uh, UNDSS. Uh, just following up on this, first the suggestions, maybe one of the test centers can do a test with this uh, different condition because uh, the different uh, tensions in the materials might have a different effect. Would be very interesting to present next year if someone can afford to do this. Uh, but my, my actual question um, on your recommendation to put into uh, the specifications very, very detailed recommendations, I will also um, possibly refer to this in my next presentation. But in case we would mention a very specific uh, requirement for the glass to be tested at uh, 50 degrees, would this limit more or less the vendors that could offer a solution? Or would the uh, different companies with the test institutions be able to provide an additional test when the glass is not tested yet in a time frame that fits into a procurement process from our side without additional cost for us as end user. I'm not sure if, if all the glass is tested, possibly not, and I, I definitely want to avoid this, so it's more a question, not, not you, but to, to uh, for the discussion also later. Would this be possible, or would I more or less limit the, the selection that I, I get to a very, very small uh, amount of bidders? Thank you. Well, I said I cannot, <laughs> I cannot answer for my competitors, but I know that there are competitors uh, uh, from us that are also in this in this uh, high quality level um, that are able to to develop or that have already uh, developed those uh, those kind of solutions. So it's um, it is possible, but the, I think the question is. Um, um, you might consider this as realistic as I'm now uh, uh, asking you. Um, and um, do you want to limit uh, the the risk of, of the occupants in the vehicle um, by, let's say, increasing the, the the quality level and the criteria for such an armored glass uh, to an extent that uh, in, an, in a special event um, of a high or low temperature, that you make sure that the people inside are, are well secured behind the glass. Yeah. So this is, I think, more a fundamental question. Um, you you might need to 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 ask yourself. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'll just uh, I'll add to it in saying that um, I think it's a very important point, Alex, that you've raised, and one that actually starts to put some of the responsibility back onto the procurement agencies in needing to think through what is the capability requirement for their vehicle system in relation to the protection requirements and the mission scenarios. If you are operating in Baghdad, for example, and your vehicle is sitting in idle mode for hours on end while the diplomat or the, the UN agents, agency is in conversation, the vehicle is in the sun and the glass is getting more and more hot, and the uh, uh, the occupants have their air conditioning on. It will have some bearing upon the protective quality of the glass. So my point being is that it is now incumbent, and what we're trying to promote is that the procurement agencies need to consider these various situations, not the day before they start writing the specification or they release the tender but in the beginning of the process, considering the capability requirement and considering uh, market surveys and market reviews, what is out there. So by the time they come into procurement mode, they understand the mission scenario, capability requirement of the vehicle system, what industry can afford, what their budgets are like. So this macro buffet of information, if you like, can come together so that when you do go out to tender and you do ask for a certain requirement or specification of a component, you have added knowledge and confidence that industry is able to provide and within the cost elements that are within your budget. It's a great challenge. I believe that the procurement agencies are getting better at it. Is there room for improvement? Of course there is. Uh, but it's 
that's the trend that really needs to come through. The type of work I know that you guys are doing is actually bringing that to the forefront in your organisation. And so when you do go to procurement, you're actually doing that with a better business system.